Dr. Valmik, uh, I think I have a few questions to ask you about this upcoming book of yours. Uh, it's, it's created a lot of rumors and people are talking about it. They do not know still what is it all about. So why don't you do the honors and tell us what this book is all about? I think two years ago, I was researching a book on tiger encounters of the last 500 years. While researching a book on tiger encounters, I realized suddenly that as all the British sportsmen and some of the Mughals and some of the Maharajas went out hunting, their encounters with lions and cheetahs were very few. And I started getting suspicious. Basically, that's how the book started. And I went more and more into the subject when ultimately, if you look at the 19th century records, roughly for every 2000 tigers killed every year, 3000 leopards killed every year, 4000 wolves killed every year, there were hardly one or two cheetahs killed a year or one or two lions killed a year. And these are recorded facts. So it doesn't, didn't make sense really that these could be indigenous species that flourished in India's so-called bush country, open grassland, because lion prides and cheetahs don't live in thick forest. So I was suspicious and I went after this idea of finding more and more clues as to what could have happened. What you're saying is that there were fewer uh, lions and, and cheetahs being hunted. Not only fewer, negligible. Negligible. So does that mean that we are trying to uh, retell some stories about the natural history of India? I think we have to investigate much more deeply and thoroughly the natural history of India, the history of these species. If in 1780 and 1790, Thomas Williamson categorically states that there are no lions in Hindustan after hunting 15 years around India and all its areas of India, particularly pig sticking. Pig sticking country was where lions and cheetahs should be because these were open bushy grasslands on the edges of forests. He says there are no lions in Hindustan and the last lion that he knows that came to India was from Persia. These are important things. Then you have Kareri in 1695 who says that the Goa governor imported a male lion from Mozambique. Why was the Goa governor bringing a lion from Mozambique if he could get it right near Gir or Katyawar, which was 200 kilometers down the line? So we have to go much more deeply into old shipping records, what happened, very difficult because all this was kept in secret. Trade routes were secret. What I've done is just opened up a huge amount of information for more scholars to follow, more information than has ever been opened up before on the lion and cheetah and their history. So in a nutshell, what we're trying to say here is that uh, you're not rewriting history, you're just asking some pointed questions and it, you're opening up questions for people, researchers, historians and scholars to try and answer, including geneticists who should be able to find more details about what may have happened uh, with these species about their uh, distribution in India. Is, is that you see, while I was doing my research on the tiger, I could no longer take for granted what everyone across the world had taken for granted, that the lion and cheetah were indigenous to India. So what I did was, I started with the premise that they weren't. And I found more and more information that they weren't. So I believe in my premise. It's up to others now to find even more information. Like as I read more and more books, and I think I nearly reached 700, 750 books, my encounter rate in the pages of the books I read kept falling with lions and cheetahs. It didn't go up. As you read more and more, there were more and more people saying that you never saw these species. Therefore, you get a book called Exotic Aliens because this is the only way it makes sense. And I roped in what is one of the most eminent historians in the world who happens to be my aunt, Professor Romila Thapar, and a young Mughal scholar called Yusuf Ansari to add new dimensions and details to very critical periods of what could have happened in ancient India, what could have happened in Mughal India. So in a way, it was our team that put a new premise together, which others have to now dwell much deeper do doctorates, research, history, natural history, art history. All of it is there for them to get into. Sure. Uh, can, can you tell since when and till when, what were the books or uh, uh, records you were looking at while doing this book? Roughly, uh, what was it? I had to probably cross there? something, as far as I'm personally am concerned, 2000 to 2500 years of records. And as far as Professor Thapar is concerned, it probably goes to 3,000 years, 3,500, 4,500, because she starts in the Harappan civilizations. We already know 
that rock art and uh, rock paintings didn't have lions? And why did Mahenju Daru seals not have lions? So she deals with that question. So it's a few thousand years of information that we've struggled with and come out with a premise which we believe in. Today, we only left with Asiatic lions or what we call as Asiatic lions in Gir in Gujarat. Would you like to say something about that given your uh, research into history and a bit of uh, genetics as well that you've done? Well, I found it fascinating at some level that around 1886 to 1896, the British with the Nawab of Junagar counted something like 12 to 20 lions. Some people say there could be 30, but let's say 12 to 20 lions left in the private hunting grounds of the Nawab of Junagar. The Nawab of Junagar claimed ownership of these lions and said, now these are my property and I'm going to breed them. How he bred them, how he hand reared them, how he fed them, we don't know. But this was the population of 12 to 20 that created today's population of 300 or 350 gear lions. DNA results from all over the world suggest that they are highly inbred. Their genetic samples are like identical twins. And in some cases, the zoo studies that were done on what were considered pure Asiatic lions and then this zoo breeding program was dropped showed African forebears in their genetic uh, um, uh, analysis. And to me, this is interesting and should, one should go further into it because I do believe that wherever huge, good, male lions were found, they were brought in by the kings. They were brought in by the Mughal emperors. The Maharajas had absolute power to bring anything in from anywhere in the world. That's why cheetahs came in in crates. After all, this book is not just about lions. It's also about cheetahs. And I found the man who trained cheetahs in Africa, who sent crate loads of cheetahs to India. And it's a given fact that in the 20th century, there are records of cheetahs coming in their hundreds and several hundreds. I believe this happened in previous centuries. There's no reason for it not to be not to have happened. There were ships and fleets on the western coast bringing and taking animals. Let's not forget that for the Roman games in the first, second century CE, we sent nearly 100 tigers for the Roman games. 600 lions went from Africa for the Roman games. So the ships of those times moved animals back and forth. And we have a huge amount of exotics coming in of every shape and kind. Everyone wanted to see something new. Giraffes. The Nawab of Abad had giraffes. The Maharaja of Baroda had giraffes. The Mughal kingdom had giraffes. People love to get giraffes. Can you imagine giraffes on ships coming to India? So what is in lions and cheetahs coming? That was easy for them to bring. So everyone has to get into this much more to know what really India had. And therefore I conclude this book by saying there was a wild forest, which was really where India's indigenous species lived like tigers and leopards. And everyone talks about this. And there was the more tamer forest on the edge, which were the, the, the Maharaja's private hunting lands. And these were not small areas. Mughal emperors had private hunting parks that could be beyond 1000 square kilometers. Sometimes roped in, sometimes fenced in, looked after by the army, fully protected. Nobody was allowed inside them. Here you could breed animals. What the Nawab of Junagar did in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century could have been done by the Mughals earlier with a breeding population of lions. We haven't got to the bottom of this because the lion was a royal symbol. It was a royal animal. The Mughals and the kings don't give out their secrets. They also don't give out the secrets of the animals they think are royal. The crest. The beautiful mane of the lion made it something that every king all over the world wanted. The lions went alive to China where there were no lions. We have enough records of this. The lion art was all over Europe and it was full of lion art without having lions in the last 5,000 years sitting around Europe. And as far as Mexico, lions were worshipped. So wherever there were rulers, the lion had some magic that connected it to the kings. Tell us something about the cheetahs. Uh, because you're talking about cheetahs as well in this book. Cheetahs, in a strange way, are much easier to tell the story of because of the fact that if you look at all the early travelogues to India, everyone saw cheetahs, but they saw them on the leash. They saw them as a pet, as a royal pet. They saw them on the back of a bullock cart being released for a hunt to catch black buck. Okay, this was all over India. Every princeling, Maharaja, a wealthy person, and later on the British elite kept cheetahs like you keep dogs. So they came in as gifts, in my opinion, over the last five, seven hundred years for everyone. Anyone who came to give a tribute to an emperor or king brought cheetahs. They were difficult to breed. There are not so many breeding records of cheetahs. So 
the cheetah was a tame animal seen in India and that's how it got propagated in my opinion as a species in India. In the wild? Seen or shot records? Very few. I think serious scholars have said that between something like 1760, 1770 to 1960, 1965, there are some 200 and cheetah records of seen or shot. That's one a year. So my opinion is very clear about the cheetah that whatever was seen or shot in different parts of India were escapees. They ran away from their leash. They ran away while hunting black buck. There were not enough stories about cheetahs with baby cubs as you will get when you go to places in Africa. There were not enough stories about actual wild observation of cheetahs. There was a great mix up between leopards and cheetahs. The use of both these words. So you have to look very carefully at descriptions whether the guy is talking about a cheetah or whether he's talking about a leopard because they're totally different predators. So I'm convinced about the cheetah uh, in terms of it being uh, uh, imported because it was so elegant, so graceful and a fantastic pet, the fastest animal on land for anyone with wealth to possess and the great fun of the sport of hunting with cheetahs. It was the sport of hunting with cheetahs that created this huge uh, captive population of cheetahs right across India. In a nutshell, where from here? Now this book is going to uh, create a lot of noise. People are going to uh, read it. Where do we go from here? Uh, what do you see happening from here? I hope serious people who are interested in the history of species go deeper and find out more records. I spent two years of my life on this and it was an accident because I didn't expect to do it as I said at the beginning. It just happened that I got obsessed because there was a suspicion and I followed my suspicions. Now people have to find out why, how, what and whatever information they collect, let's say they collect enough information to counter my premise, I'm happy to be corrected. I have no problems in being corrected. But I want people to go deeper into these issues, whether it is the geneticist, whether it is the historian, whether it is the natural historian. As far as I'm concerned, I learned the history of the world through the eyes of these animals. I had to traverse everywhere where they went to try and understand both lion art, why the symbol, symbol of the lion, what do all the goddesses riding the lion mean? Because they ride the lion everywhere in the world. What are the connections between people and their animals? I think there's enough information for those who are really interested. I don't think there are lots of people who are going to be interested. A small minority who are really interested, who like research, who like the scholarship of looking at these issues will get into it. And I hope it opens new areas of thinking, a new way to, to look at species. Maybe someone should look at the caracal. Is there a connection with the caracal also being imported? And why is the caracal found so, so minutely in these areas? Where did it originally come from? I think there's a great study to be done in India about all these things. So I hope it opens the doors and windows for more study. It provokes research. It should provoke more research into these areas. Because I'm not an academic. I never considered myself an academic. Neither am I a scientist. I am a naturalist who stumbled on all these things and try, and try to put them together to provoke more research because it's fascinating. The world of natural history is fascinating. So I stumbled on something and therefore exotic aliens.